welcome everybody to our third History on Location with Robert Scaby. It was really a great idea. Um, now, I'm going to jump right into it because, as I say, I always start at the beginning of things and maybe I get long talking about things. So if you need to leave, that's okay, I understand. But I'm going to hopefully go as fast as I can without missing things. Um, I, I was thinking I could start with a question, which came first, the village or the train? And I sort of want to know how many people know that answer, village or the train? The which? Arnfield. Yes, that's right. Okay, that's why I'm going all the way back to these things. Okay, well, what I wanted to say was that Millbrook has always had a little bit of magic in it for me, I think, as I learn the history over and over. There's always some story behind it. And we've always had lots of influence from New York, from the start, I'm sure. Um, and if you have done genealogy, uh, maybe those who didn't actually grow up in town, but you've done genealogy, you may have found that relatives or ancestors came through Dutchess County or Columbia County on their way from the New England states westward, and they may have ended up staying or moving on, because you find a lot of people out in the west, Ohio and Michigan and Wyoming, who had relatives who came through here, and they want to look up the nine partners patent and find out, you know, if the names are there. So that's always kind of fun. Um, so the story that I wanted to tell is about the people who came here and why they came here and sort of the innovations along the way that brought them here. Um, you know, not major innovations, but innovations in the, the development of our history. Um, you may have heard of George Hunter Brown. How many people have heard of George Hunter Brown? Okay, <laughs> the historical. And how many have heard of Matthew Franklin Merritt? Hey, Matthew Franklin Merritt? Okay. Um, the question is, who were they? We use their names all the time, but who were they? Um, they, they were two protagonists, really, a financier and a developer who came to town. Um, and it's really for you to decide who has the merits of being titled the founder of Millbrook. Um, and it may be other people um, among them also. Um, so it all started long, long ago. <laughs> what major water feature is to our west? That way. Hudson River. Yes, <laughs> Hudson River. Bingo. Um, so everyone from the beginning of time, including Native Americans, wanted to get to the Hudson River, even from this interior and even from the western part of Connecticut. They needed to get to the Hudson River for the the river ports to get then to other world ports. And um, where we're standing right now, by the mid-1700s, uh, we were within the Nine Partners Patent, and it was being settled mainly by Quaker families. So that's really key to Millbrook. It's Quaker, Quaker families who came here um, from the south. And they looked at this as a remote area with little competition. Them. And they um, they had um, good farmland, they found, and they had water power. And some of these family names still create the foundation of our community. It's like Thorn and Hart and Hate and Coffin, <laughs> all sorts of names. Um, Merritt is one of them. They were Quaker. So they were drawn to this area for that reason. And with these resources, they built mills, and they prospered into their future. Um, farm clearings grew. They began to grow surplus, and they milled a lot of that. Um, the cart tracks, you can find on maps, the term cart track, which is a lot of fun, um, became established public roads over time. And this is what this is I'm calling my concept map <laughs> that I just sketched up. Um, this is. Hudson River, so it goes that way, really, and Dover and Sharon, Connecticut. And um, the yellow I'm looking at 
are the roads uh, from the mid-1700s. And this road was called the Old Dover Road. Um, in 1718, it was, it was uh, mentioned as a trail. And by 1748, it was mentioned as a public road. Um, it goes from Dover up Plymouth Hill to Little Rest to Mechanic. Mechanic is where the Quaker Meeting House is. Crosses over to Hart's Village, so, and I don't know exactly where. <laughs> it's always a little confusing. And then to Washington Hollow, and then it shot up like across Crumb Elbow, and eventually up to the Rhinecliffe Landing, which brought them to the river. Um, this stretch is called the Filkentown Road, and that's first mentioned in 1743. Uh, it's Filken was one of the original nine partners, and this section of the road from Washington Hollow took you to the upper landing in Poughkeepsie. And um, so, those are the roads that I wanted to look at for that moment. And so, in here, there's no Millbrook yet. <laughs> it's just, it's road systems, trails and cart roads and wagon roads. Um, but what we had was the hamlet of Mechanic and Hart's Village. So Mechanic, in the, by the mid-1700s, was being settled by Quaker families and the Thorns among them. Um, it was one of the first settlements along this road. Um, the, Samuel Mabbitt had an inn there that, <laughs> that welcomed the uh, wayfarers from New England going to the Hudson. And two of the Thorn sons opened a, uh, a general store in 1795, and we have sketches of it, and it's, it was um, quite an operation. It was a landmark general store. People came from miles around, um, so like Pleasant Valley, they'd come to their store for agricultural implements and that sort of thing. So, um, so and then Hart's Village, and everyone knows where Hart's Village is, over that way. Um, Hart's Village was, um, well, Richard Hart in 1755 first built a mill at Hart's Village, and then 1760, Trip Mosier, the mill, and then uh, Philip Hart, who many of you may have heard of. When he came along um, soon after all of that, he took on the family holdings and um, expanded their holdings and became land rich and, and trade rich. He did very well. It's a very prosperous area in Hart's Village because it, the um, east branch of the Wappingers begins in Little Rest, around Little Rest, or around here, Little Rest, and eventually enters the Wappinger Creek, but it drops 500 feet elevation in, in that uh, distance, and Hart's Village um, had five dams for mills within a mile stretch. So it's the elevation change that allowed those waterways, the, well, the use of that waterway for power. Um, Okay, so then, um, so given that we're basically moving toward a railroad that we're going to talk a tiny bit about, um, I wanted to, to check in at the, the transportation in 1790s. The town became the town of Washington in 1788. It was Charlotte Precinct before that. But it became a town. and. The economy of our town was agriculture and manufacture, great agricultural land, water power. Um, and at the same time, when we step back and think about it, the, um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, the immigrants from the New England states were coming through. And uh, so farming was good and markets were good and people People were farming, and you know, and uh, like even there was a growing European demand for our wheat and, and grains. So, what we needed was to get that produce and product to market. So, where do we want to go? To the 
the Hudson. <laughs> Missed to the Hudson. Um, at this point, canals were limited. The Erie Canal came in 1825. And they even talked about a proposed canal from Armenia to, I think, Poughkeepsie um, in that time period, 1830s or so. But that fizzled. And also, uh, the railroads, this is back in the 1790s, 1800s, railroads weren't spoken of yet. So turnpikes were the innovation at that point. They could legislate them from the state. They could collect money and um, you know, have uh, uh, particular stats that they needed to build as all the particulars for construction of the road. <clears throat> and they had stockholders. So it's no surprise that in 1802, when the Duchess Turnpike, which we still call the Duchess Turnpike, it starts at the courthouse in Poughkeepsie and goes to Dover and goes to Sharon. Um, when that was proposed, William Thorne, the mechanic uh, merchant, and Philip Hart were among uh, the 21 charter members of that. And what they hoped to do was improve the local trade, land values, and bring prosperity to the community. So by 1804, St. Green, the Green now, is the Duchess Turnpike starts in Poughkeepsie, it goes to um, Washington, well, Washington Hollow, and then it goes to this point, right where the road to Cary Institute comes out. And that is exactly at that time period in 1804 when they constructed the turnpike. That's when they said, and the branch will go off to Sharon, Sharon Branch, that's why it's Sharon Turnpike, and the branch will go to Dover, the Dover Turnpike. We still use those names and addresses. It's kind of interesting. Um, so, um, but we weren't a destination yet. We're, we're still just, we're, you know, where we're standing, we're just sitting there in the middle. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, between Hearts Village and Mechanic. Four Corners also is an important <laughs> Um, but the innovators were always looking for quicker access for the farmers and the industry of Dutchess County. And, and... Um, well, even Connecticut, Connecticut, Eastern Duchess, they wanted to get to the Hudson River ports. So um, Poughkeepsie always remained that central funneling point in this picture. But I think it's interesting that in 1832 and 1836, so back that far, a railroad was proposed. Um, it just seems so early. <laughs> um, and it was proposed to go from the village of Poughkeepsie to the Connecticut line. And there were two men in our town, town of Washington, who were involved in that. The, the second one in 1836 was Isaac Merritt. And do people know of the Isaac Merritt homestead? Have you heard of that? Huh. Okay, well, we'll skip to that in a little bit. Um, he is a brother of our other star, the Matthew Franklin Merritt. I don't want to talk about. So, um, it became apparent through the 1840s and 50s that the railroads brought general prosperity and commerce to those areas they crossed. So, enter George Hunter Brown. Um, he was an intrepid dreamer and financier. And he arrived in the town of Washington during the Civil War. He was born in 1835, um, so I guess he was in his 30s at that point. The Brown family was known for establishing banking houses in uh, Philly and Baltimore and New York and England. And his father actually, uh, Mr. Brown's father, had established the New York branch of Brown Brothers and Company, which I guess became Brown Brothers and Harriman um, in 1825. And they were major lenders to textile, commodities, and transportation industries which becomes interesting in this whole picture, that they, it was very relevant of who they lent to and invested in. So, um, Mr. Brown came for health reasons to the town of Washington, but he was only here 12 years, and he accomplished an incredible amount. He could be known as an estate builder, a church builder, and a railroad builder, because he, he actually built several churches of different denominations 
here in our area, um, Sunday schools, parsonages, between 1864 and 70, all the time that the railroad was being, you know, patched over and brought in. Um, and it, they were financed either by he or his father, typically, and, um, and he even used his architect for his house, uh, Edward Tucker Potter, for a number of the structures. Um, but um, it, the, the reason he said he, he wanted to give back to the church, uh, the minutes appeared in the Millbrook Reformed Church, which was in Four Corners, where the monument is. Uh, people can actually understand this map. <laughs> I'm seeing it in the map, but the, the corners where the monument is by Bennett, old Bennett. Okay, the Reformed Church was there, and that was his church. Um, so he also built his estate in 1864, it was completed. He had purchased 159 acres that straddled the, the well, what is now the Dover Turnpike, or 44, actually, and Shady Dell. So it was at the corner of Shady Dell Road, that whole area. Um, his home, if I have this all straight, eventually became Thorncrest. Um, and um, he had a mill at the bottom of that hill, and you can see the remnants of it still. When you pass toward Shady Dell, toward Shady Dell Road, before that, the home that's there on the corner, right before that home is a pond, a ponded area, dammed area, and those are remnants of the mill. So. Um, and the important thing here, probably a key point, is that he called his country seat Millbrook Farms. So that's where it all begins. <laughs> um, now, Mr. Brown shared the longtime dream of a cross-country railroad, and of course there was a continuing interest base within the entire county. In 1865, he held a meeting down in Burbank, this way, um, where over 200 people attended, and it was going to be to uh, survey a railroad from Boston Corners, which is above Millerton, down to Fishkill Landing. And, um, of course, they elected officers, and George Hunter Brown became one of the six vice presidents. Um, they needed a vice president for each town the railroad went through, but, you know, he was, he was right there. And there were two explore three different routes. Um, the one that they chose out of the three was the one that goes Bengal, Hearts Village, Four Corners. And you know, that's where the railroad bed still lies. Um, and so in 1866, in the spring, uh, he hosted another meeting at his newly built church church in, in Four Corners. I'm talking about trying to find meeting space and <laughs> venues. <laughs> so he used that and they, um, they, they chartered the Duchess and Columbia Railroad, 1866. It was chartered. Um, and it was to cost slightly over a million dollars at that time, 1866. Um, and at the same time, Mr. Brown also became the town supervisor in 1866. So, like, he must have come with gusto, and then he kind of left with gusto, too, I think. Um, so the first railroad to originate in Dutchess County, the Dutchess and Columbia, was born. Um, the line was completed between 69 and 71. And in, a diff, in, a, in addition to it being financed by Mr. Brown and others, other local residents worked very hard to raise funds. And, and you know, I'm sure they don't get enough credit for <laughs> all the involvement that it took around here. But among those local residents was Robert Coffin, who built the first station down at what is now Oak Summit. They named it Coffin. And then I guess they quickly changed the name when they didn't want to say next stop, Coffin. So the name was later changed, and it's Oak Summit, that's what it became. 
the next station was placed midway between Four Corners and Hearts Village. Right there. <laughs> right on that green. Um, and there are people here who may remember that station. I remember that. Um, so, um, so a couple years went by and, oh, well, I missed a very important item, Millbrook Farms. When this station was built, they then used, in honor of uh, George Hunter Brown, they used his farm's name, Millbrook. So that's where the Millbrook name comes from, as, as the story goes. <laughs> um, so a couple of years went by. The railroad was not a financial success. They didn't get the business they expected. Um, you know, there had been um, the panic of 73 and, and a depression, so many smaller railroads failed at that point. Also, uh, refrigerator cars came out in 68, so right in the midst of putting this railroad down. Um, so it, it sort of um, lessened the need for, for quick transport, as, as quick transport of perishables. It was an issue. Um, okay, and then, th that, so in 73, the line was consolidated with New York, Boston, Northern Railroad, but this also failed. So then, in 76, it was sold under foreclosure, and the railroad was reorganized under the name of Newburgh, Dutchess, and Connecticut. So, that one, I, I have something more in my bag <laughs> about that name, the Newburgh, Dutchess, and Connecticut Railroad. Um, and on that board was Samuel Thorne and Robert G. Coffin. So still, there were people from this area on the board and taking leads. So we do know that Mr. Brown had serious financial problems. Uh, we don't know how much money he actually invested um, beyond the, the rolling stock. His family maintained the rolling stock in the company. But in 1877, so this is what eight years, so eight eight years later, he sold all his property in Duchess to his lawyer for fifteen thousand, and he was living in France at the time of the sale. <laughs> so he whisked in, he whisked out, and except for a few unavoidable visits, he stayed away from Millbrook. When he came back from France, he built a house in Sharon, Connecticut. And that's where he died in 1901, at the age of 66. So, um, now, I, I guess I'm probably throwing dates out, and it's easier when you see them on paper, but we're going to roll back the clock again to 1869, when the railroad was completed here. Um, and we're going to bring Matthew Franklin Merritt into the picture. Uh, so in 1869 is the year that Matthew Franklin Merritt purchased from the widow Haight uh, her uh, 145 acres of her farm land. This is also a critical piece of the whole picture because uh, is everyone familiar with what the Haight farmhouse would be down the road? It's where Sloan Architects are now, and it's it's. Uh, recognizes the oldest house in Milford. Um And the Haight Farm was basically a rectangle from the water treatment plant today, that's down there, to the post office, and then up to the top of uh, Maple beyond the band shell. So it was a rectangular farm. So, um, uh, Franklin Merritt um, continued to purchase properties and add to that over the years. Um, and he began to lay out streets. He spent the rest of his life patiently carving up the hate farm. Um, and it, it didn't happen overnight. He didn't just come in whisk in and <laughs> carve it up, sell it off, and he was out of here. Um, he, um, he laid out Front Street. So that's sort of where we begin. He laid out Front Street. And Front Street ended up being, from post office down to the farmhouse, the area designated for 
uh, for freight loading and uh, coal storage and extensive lumber yards, which even when I came in the mid 80s, uh, I still saw remnants of all of that. So it, it lasted a long while. Um, and we have remnants around. Different people's properties have pieces of those lumber yard sheds at this point. We could tell you where they are. Um, and the two principal streets that he laid out are Franklin and Merritt. <laughs> and it would be so much fun to look into this further, like find his correspondence and where he found some of the ideas. Five, 25, okay. Um, Franklin Avenue is a, sort of a, a state-of-the-art avenue, a planned community in a sense. It's a wider avenue when you look at it. When two cars can pass and we have parking on both sides. And when you drive up, there are no, except I think there's one driveway now, all the way up to Maple, only one driveway that comes out to Front Street, or Franklin, I mean, Franklin Avenue, only one driveway. Because there were alleyways on either side of Franklin that allowed delivery of the ice and coal and, and milk at that point in time. And you can see everyone's sheds in the back um, that may have housed a, you know, a horse and a, a carriage or a wagon at that point in time. Um, so that's a lot of fun to look at. Um, also, Washington Avenue was in there, and um, it started at a right angle to Front Street and then veered off towards Mechanic. So now, um, what I had fun doing was finding out who this guy was, Franklin Merritt, because Again, we talk about him, we use his name all the time, but uh, I didn't know who he was, really. And he was not a stranger to this area. Uh, it, the Merritts were a Quaker family. They came north from Rye, Westchester, and came to the Oblong meeting down in, uh, at Quaker Hill in the latter 1700s. And if I've done my genealogy correctly, and everything matches, um, Matthew, Matthew Franklin Merritt's great uncle, Nimiah Merritt Jr., was a merchant here in the town of Washington in the 1790s. And then his, and he married Phoebe Wing, another name from here. Um, his father, Nehemiah M. Merritt, married Phoebe Thorne. And she was born in the town of Washington. So, and she was a, a daughter of William Thorne. They, so uh, Franklin Merritt's parents, Phoebe Thorne and Nehemiah M. Merritt, had eight children. And Isaac Merritt was one of them. And I spoke about the Merritt homestead. It's, it's over in Hart's Village, across Sharon Turnpike, up on the hill. It's a long hill. It's up on the hill, and that's the Merritt Homestead. I, I've heard of it as Merritt Homestead. And that was built by Philip Hart for his daughter, Eliza Hart, when she married Isaac Merritt. So they were tied in nicely to, to the Millbrook area. Um, and then Franklin Merritt was the youngest of those eight children. He was 16 years younger than Isaac. Uh, their mother died in 1823, so I'm thinking that Matthew Franklin Merritt was only eight years old when his mother died. But I think he was brought up in New York City. So many of these people had, you know, they, they went back and forth from here and also over to Connecticut. Um, so Matthew Franklin was born in Flushing, Queens. His father was listed as a dry goods merchant on Pearl Street and also a preacher in the Society of the Friends of Quaker Hill, which I don't know what it takes to be designated a preacher, <laughs> but he was listed as that at one point. So um, I, that's where I'm assuming he grew up in New York, but he's listed in the city directories of New York City in all sorts of businesses during his career from the 50s, 60s, 70s that I particularly looked at. Uh, in the 60s, I saw various references to builder of engines and ships and ship chief and iron 
which iron is interesting because both he and George Hunter Brown had um, a, a relationship with iron ore operations, or maybe this was an iron manufacturer that uh, Franklin Merritt had in, in New York. Um, so there's, you know, there's interest in iron all along the way. Um, he was also listed as a merchant. And then lastly, in the 1890s, in the city directory, he's listed as a builder in the 90s. He was still alive. <laughs> he was busy developing out the village as best he could. It wasn't, well, it wasn't technically an incorporated village at this point, it, but they called it village. Um, and in the census and the city directories, he lives in Stamford, Connecticut. So he didn't live here, he lived in Stamford. Um, actually, in 1850, I thought this was just kind of fun. 1850, when he was 35, he lived with his in-laws, <laughs> the Quintards, in Stamford. And then in the 60s and 70s, he lived next door to his sister-in-law, which was actually a half-sister-in-law, which is another whole route with Alan, my brother-in-law, <laughs> and my husband, who started Merritt Bookstore, that's a whole loop on the side that I could talk about, but um, that merit is related to merit. Anyway, um, he, he served in the Connecticut Assembly, and he, he well, he's buried in Stanford, Connecticut, so he's over there. He had three daughters and a son. His son is Schuyler Merritt, and... Um, his son was born on, it says, 5th Avenue and 21st Street. I don't know, that address sounds impressive to me. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know New York well enough. But, um, so that's where Franklin was, down, down in that area when his son was born. Um, but his son, Schuyler Merritt, graduated from Yale and then Columbia Law School. He was seven terms in Congress um, as a Republican from 1917 to 31. And he was an enthusiastic chairman of the Merritt Parkway. So that's why it's the Merritt Parkway. So the Merritt Parkway in Connecticut is named after the son of Franklin Merritt <laughs> in Millbrook. So there's, there's a neat tie-in, I think. Um, he's also buried in Stanford, Connecticut. So back to the task of laying out the village. Um, lots were purchased and, and homes begun and shops opened. And it didn't happen overnight. The first sale was in 1869, and then they, the sales fluctuated. Um, so from 1869, when he started selling off parcels, um, the sales, sometimes it was zero sales that year, and sometimes it was 11 sales. When I looked in the land records, um, 1870, when he first started out, and then 1888, toward the, the end of his his. Uh, career in doing this, um, he had sold 11 each year. So that sounds like a, a substantial number of properties. They were mixed, uh, commercial and residential. And when you look at the census from 1860 and then jump to 1870, um, his, his real estate value quadrupled. At the time period, he bought the hay farm and started selling off parcels. Um, so, then I have photos, let's see, okay. this is fun, I'll pass these around where people can look later, whatever. Um, this is a great photo, we all love this, many of you may have seen it already, but it's, it's standing as though we're up in the tribute gardens, looking down, and it shows the bank building, which was built as the headquarters of the Duchess and Columbia Columbia, wait a minute, with the Duchess of Columbia Railroad. Um, it was built in 1871. The department store was built in 1870, and it's the first commercial building on Front Street, or in the village area. It's the first commercial building. And businesses opened onto Front Street. All the doors opened onto Front Street. It's, it was Front Street. So I thought it was kind of interesting when you think about it, the bank opens onto Franklin. And I wonder if that has anything to say about you know, the <laughs> substantialness of the bank rather than a commercial operation. 
kind of fun. So um, this is a later photo, though, I have to say. It's 1904. The Thorn Building. The Thorn Building is in it. But I can pass these around. And there's another great photo. It's not dated, but it's on the back. With lots of cart tracks, wagon tracks. You can see the narrow little trails in the mud. It's great. Here, pass them on around that way. Um, OK, and the passenger station. I'll let everybody take a look at that as we go. And there's writing on the back. Here's a department store. Back in, I think this is a 1904. Uh, let exactly. But this is an early photo of the department store. And it's opening on the front street here. If you look at that. It's kind of fun to stand here and look and compare it. Here we go. There we go. And the bank building. Um, more about it even there. Okay. And another, another photo of the department store inside. Okay. Um, now. So, I don't know, in the meantime, just a quick run through that when Franklin Merritt started selling all the properties and developing this area, churches began to move in. Grace Church, the Episcopal Church, um, the church itself had burned. It was in Hearts Village and had burned in 1870. So in 1871, they purchased property right up across from DMV and they built. And uh, the WCTU, that's an important one, where McLaughlin is now on the four corners up here, um, they purchased property from uh, Franklin Merritt in 1881 and built their own hall the next year. And it was the only hall available for lectures and meetings and other uses until 1894. So now we have um, 1891 comes along. So we've gone 1869 and kind of, you know, sold, sales fluctuated through all the years, um, in the 70s, 80s. And then 1891, Franklin Merritt is now 76. So he's getting a little on in age. And he transferred his ownership of his unsold lots to an entity called the Millbrook Land and Improvement Company, and it included the Haight Farmhouse. So it's all the unsold lots went to the Land and Improvement Company. And when you look in the land records, the deed uh, of deeds, that's what it's now termed, Millbrook Land and Improvement Company. Um, and his properties now extended from roughly the, the Haight Farm up here to where around where maybe the side of the golf and tennis club, and then from what was Bennett over to Nine Partners. So it was a, a pretty substantial area. Um, and this is the map, and I'll pass this around. Um, I, you know, I think, I, I think given time, <laughs> this is a very interesting map, but I found that it has many questions on it, I think, because the parcels in 1891, when he transferred these parcels over to the Land and Improvement Company, um, it says the red-tinted parcels had been sold prior to 1891. The green parcels were being conveyed in 1891, and then there were blank ones that were reserved for Franklin Merritt himself. And you'll see, though, that the map had faded. So you really can't see. There's, there's red and green in here, but that's just ripples in the fabric. Um, so you can't see. And there are other questions I have about this, like the uh, depart this, this would be Franklin. This is Franklin, and this is Merritt. This says the, the um, it says the DNC Railroad. So it doesn't say Newburgh Duchess and Connecticut Railroad in 1891. So I, I don't know if this is like a working piece for him out of his office. There are surveyor's marks on him and all. Um, and also the, the department store is blank. And they would have been sold already and opened as a department store. So I'm not exactly sure why. But it's fun to look at and I think it deserves a lot more uh, research.
research into it. I'm sure there are people who have done that to this point. So, okay, so I have another fun piece to show that 1890s, now we're up in the 1890s still, 1891, it was a period of great development and growth. Uh, the turnpike that I had originally showed, the, the green turnpikes, had dissolved at that point in time. During the blizzard of 1888, they just went, we can't handle this anymore. <laughs> um, it was costly, and I guess the stockholders weren't really getting any returns on it. Um, so that dissolved. The roadways went to the town. That property went to the town, so that's this was town. Uh, and I guess state after that. Um, and also the two hamlets, the Mechanic and Hearts Village, had withered. Um, because everything like saying the churches started to come in and you know everyone started building within this area. So um, this is something that I just came across in our Historical Society archives, and I couldn't find a date. Someone said they think they saw an 1892 date. So this would be right after Franklin Merritt had transferred his property to the, uh, the Land and Improvement Company. Um, this pamphlet was put together for the Newburgh, Dutchess, and Connecticut Railroad. You know, the railroad it had become. And um, so it's 1892. Their headquarters, I guess, is in Mattawa, New York. Um, but this says, Millbrook Land and Improvement Company uh, offers for sale in desirable, its desirable property in large and small plots. Inquire of James Reardon, agent, Bank of Millbrook. It's really fun to look at. And then up here is the Bank of Millbrook, and it shows all the officers and the, the board of directors. And when you look through the board of directors, it's all the names we know from Millbrook, from the history and, and even today. Um, there it is, by 1892, so it was there. And the other fun part is the Millbrook Inn, which was right down this road. Um, there is a yellow, yellowish barn. Do people generally know where the Millbrook Inn was? Would look around to know it. But um, it was a grand inn. Anyway, it was right down the street by Most, right next door to Most. And I'll pass this around. You'll have to look to see what it says. Um, it says Millbrook Inn is an attractive resort for health and comfort. And it has good air and fine drives, a superb table, with selected cellar, no bar. Um, it's careful drivers, stables, well equipped. And it's two, it's only two and a quarter hours from New York, via the New York Central or Newburgh, Duchess, and Connecticut. How long does it take on the train now to get here? Well, it doesn't come here. It's not Dover. But how long? Oh, uh, that's it? Oh, okay. They're much faster. The <laughs> steam engines, I guess. But this is really fun to look at. Um, okay. So, we're almost, we're close. <laughs> so, New Year's Eve, 1895, comes along, and people might ask, why would a small village of only 1,000 or 1,100 people want to incorporate and assume all this responsibility? Um, but many of you know the story. The Thorn Building was built by um, four children of Jonathan Thorn, and they needed an entity to receive the deed and the uh, trust agreement. So, I, I love it. It's the 11th hour, New Year's Eve, <laughs> 1895, and they incorporated. And um, one thing that that did as far as development of Millbrook, when you think about it, is that with the Thorn building, um, it's now, you know, secondary education, but the students came to Millbrook for their secondary education, not only from the town of Washington, but they were riding the train from the towns north and south of here. My mother did. Yes, yes, and I, I know I have a whole audience here who... And you, you rode the train from no. Stanford Hill, didn't you? We had a car bus. Oh, oh, okay. 
you didn't have to do the domain, okay. That's good to know. All right, so, but that history goes back quite a ways. And I also just love this um, Carmine D'Arpino, who was a former historian for our town. Uh, he found it rather amusing to look at the beginnings of this new government of the village. Um, he said, as they realized that they, now not the town, were suddenly responsible for all sorts of arrangements on maintenance and services. So at their second meeting, they began to arrange a source of income. So taxes started for the village itself. And then they discovered they needed a map. They didn't know where their boundaries were for the village. So um, they, they started mapping and found the village territory just went far beyond this little area this area that was being developed. And so th they drew lines, and when you look at the boundaries of the village of Millbrook, it kind of goes and it's sort of like an abstract cross or something. And what they were trying to do was include the owners of the corner estates because they wanted to maintain their voice in the village government. So, um, you know, Thorndale, Thorncrest, Dietrich's estate, um, mm. You know, now it's the, um, the, never mind, I won't go there. Um, the Wing Estate, which was up the hill, and the Marshall Estate, which is over on 343, they're all included <laughs> in the village of Millbrook. So, now, Matthew Franklin Merritt died only about four months later after the village was incorporated. And he was 81 years old. Um, uh, George Hunter Brown was still living over in Sharon, uh, living over in Sharon, and George Hunter Brown died in 1901 at the age of 66. So uh, Mr. Brown was 20 years younger than Franklin Merritt. So I just think it's kind of interesting as far as you know the relation of generations and what we were looking at. Um, so the sales continued to grow under the Millbrook Land and Improvement Company. Organizations and clubs were created and with membership carried a degree of status symbol. The hilltoppers of the day were Thorne, Dietrich, Miller, Lamont, Flagler, Hayes, Marshall, Wing, and Davison. And all of this was setting a tone of the Millbrook that would remain much unchanged over the next 50 years. Um, so, a new era had begun in the emergence of Millbrook, and the, and the name soon overshadowed that of the town. So Millbrook was the name. People did not come to Washington. Um, they came to Millbrook. They did not live in Washington. They lived in Millbrook, and that was even if they were miles from the village. Um, geography had nothing to do with it. Millbrook was a concept <laughs> and a frame of mind. And, um, and even people who lived in other towns to the northeast of us considered themselves part of Millbrook. So I have to say, does that sound familiar? Um, we've all probably had discussions with uh, Either the post office or the town clerk or up there, straight up on the left. No, straight up on the left. It's a yellow brick. Thanks very much. Okay, well that's Millbrook. And there are also questions like when you order something online or order something for the phone, it's like I'm in Millbrook. No, I'm not. <laughs> you know, I'm in you know, Dover Postal <laughs> or something. It's always confusing. So, um, I think we're still living in the Millbrook frame of mind. And that's the magic <laughs> of it all. <laughs> um, and then, you know, who was the founder of Millbrook? Well, you know, it was, I guess maybe we'd have to say it was a community or the village. It takes a village or something like that. So, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening. Mm. <laughs> for so long. Oh my goodness. I have a question. Yes, good. Where's the end of the Oh, wait, wait, wait.
Uh, naming the the Millbrook Millbrook. The, the new tournament in the roads. Oh, the the wait a minute. Say, just say that again. The roads or the trails. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, who named? Who mentioned? Where yeah. they mentioned? Yeah. Well, Helen Reynolds Wilkerson was a, a county historian back in the twenties, and a lot of her work is just so well respected. And I know I read that in there. Um, I also spent time at the county records on the second floor of the county office building looking at records of roads um, being um, accepted as public roads. Back, there was a lot of them back in the 18, or seven, yeah, 1740s, 50s. That's when our roads started to be designated public roads. There were highway commissioners before that. And, okay, so we got our County Board of Supervisors in 1713. And at that point, well, we had, they designated road commissioners for each town or each precinct at that point. And people who lived along those stretches were responsible for their roads. And if they didn't want to do it, they had to pay someone to do it. But it was the people who took care of the road systems. Um, then they started designating public roads because they wanted better quality roads. And so, um, uh, where is it going to go with that? So, a lot of the roads became public roads through the 40s, 50s, even 70s, I suppose, whatever, through that time. And one person could petition to have it done and get signatures and take it to the uh, county clerk and have it reviewed. And it's in the books in there. It's kind of neat. Um, and then the turnpike came along, and it was really, it, it, it's a, a state legislated ability. Um, in the 1790s and into the 1810s or 20s, a lot of turnpikes were proposed. There's the Columbia Turnpike um, up in Columbia County, it goes from Great Barrington to Hudson. And then there are other ones, Salisbury Turnpike is 199 here, Red Hook, uh, Milan goes through there. Um, they all stretch over to Connecticut or into Massachusetts. And those people wanted to get to the Hudson as much as we wanted to get to the Hudson. Um, and also, I just think it's interesting. So the Quakers settled here. But when you go to the river, and on the other side of the river, it's a lot of Dutch and a lot of German. German Palatines came, and then the Dutch. They went straight to the river <laughs> to, you know, do what it, for various reasons they went to the river. And and we have fewer of those groups here in our area. Um.